Hey everybody, welcome to our Wednesday Facebook Live sponsored by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Happy to have all of you along for the ride again this week. I know we're at a slightly different time, but we thank you for rolling with us. Um, my guest this week is a familiar face to those of you who have been watching this program. I'm very, very glad to be talking again with Seth Harris. He is the former acting and deputy Deputy Secretary of Labor in the Obama administration. Um, you have no doubt seen him on all sorts of television shows weighing in on this continuing crisis that we find ourselves living through um, from both a health and an economic uh, standpoint. And we're so thrilled, Seth, to have you with us again today to be able to answer the questions that people have. I know they have a lot of them. Um, and and to just get your thoughts on where we are in, in the curve right now. So thank you. Thank you, Jean. Always a pleasure to be with you and great to be back on uh, the Facebook Live show. Thank you so much. So tell me where we are right now. I mean, if, if you were taking the the lay of the land, the pulse of, of, of the economic equation, we're four and a half months in. Um, where, where are Americans standing? Well, let me just say, first of all, I think it's shocking that it's only been four and a half months since the pandemic recession, I think we should call it, uh, began. It was really middle of March when governments started shutting down large sectors of the economy and folks began to lose jobs and lose businesses. And um, so the, the answer to the question, how's the economy doing, is that it's doing about as badly as we're doing with the pandemic a as infections go up and as hospitalizations go up and as the death rate goes up, the economy gets weaker and weaker. And that's partly because of government response, again, reclosing parts of the economy, but it's also because people are fearful. You know, they, they don't want to go out into a retail store or go to a restaurant or go to a movie theater um, if they're afraid they're going to catch a, a deadly disease. And uh, so we have seen something of a stall. We, we were recovering. We had lost about 20 million or so jobs. We've recovered uh, over the course of May and June, about a third of those jobs. And it looked like we were in the process of recovering. And then uh, after uh, the middle of June, sort of towards the end of June, we began to stall out again. And that's directly connected with the rapid growth of the pandemic in California, Georgia, Arizona, Texas, Florida, other states where there had not been a lot of exposure before. And those are very, very big economies and critically important parts of the American economy. And they have slowed down very dramatically. They began to reclose. And the fear factor in those states went way up. So I think we're stalled now, um, but now it's going to depend on government. Uh, you know, the, the, the government support that's been provided through the CARES Act and other vehicles runs out at the end of this month, the extra unemployment insurance benefits that folks have been getting, the uh, Paycheck Protection Program runs out fairly soon, or the money that people got from it is going to run out fairly soon. Other loan facilities are going to run out in the next month or two. Uh, you know, and, and really, that is, that's what's held our economy up. That's been the prop underneath our economy. That's the reason we didn't go into a deep depression, is that the government spent about $3 trillion. And it really depends on whether Congress is going to do it again. If they spend about $3 trillion more dollars, the economy will probably improve some, and we will continue on a slow recovery, not a quick one. But if they don't spend enough or they don't spend anything at all and they don't give it to the right people, we could be in very serious economic shape. Can we dig into that a little bit? Um, I've been reading the papers. I know you've got people that you talk to in Washington all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been seeing a trillion. Um, I haven't really been seeing another three trillion. Do you worry that they won't spend or won't spend enough? I'm I'm very deeply worried about that. So the the Senate Republicans are talking about something in the vicinity of a trillion dollars. 
The House Democrats passed a bill, the HEROES Act, that is a three to three and a half trillion dollar package. And now the question is, where do they end up? But right now, the problem is that the Republican Party really hasn't settled on its answer. There's a disagreement between the White House and uh, Senate Republicans. Senate Republicans are disagreeing with one another. Some of them are quite emphatically opposed to any additional spending. Some of them are very worried about business bankruptcies and, and personal bankruptcies growing as they should be. Um, so they're, they're negotiating with one internally right now to try to figure out what position they're going to take. Um, I think that three, my view is that three trillion is about right, maybe a little bit less than what we really need. One trillion will cause us to suffer a, a decline in the economy. It may prop up certain parts of the economy, but it's not going to be good enough. Let me just say it's better than nothing. Uh, and I never thought in my life that I would be saying a trillion dollars is not enough spending. But, you know, we're a $21 trillion economy. And yeah. for four and a half months, we've been on and off, shut down, depressed, closed, fearful. And, you know, if you want to keep the, the wheels of the economy going, you're going to have to pump a bunch of money in there because we're now talking about this is the last bill we're going to get uh, probably until the new year. It's got to be enough to be able to carry us. When you say the money has to get to the right people, what people are those? So, you know, it's this is a, a fairly elementary concept that often gets lost in these discussions. And that is, if you want the economy to grow, give money to the people who are going to turn right around and spend it, right? Because that's how you get gross domestic product to grow is, you know, if you give me a dollar and I turn around and spend it, that's two dollars in the mm -hmm. domestic product. And if the person I spend it with turns around and spends it with a supplier, that's three dollars. And so you have to give it to the people who are going to spend it. So I don't need it. I'm not speaking for you, but my guess is you don't need it either. But unemployed workers, food insecure families, uh, small businesses, state and local governments, the folks who are going to just turn right around and pump that money right back into the economy. Um, that's really where we need the spending. We don't need tax cuts for the wealthy. We don't need payroll tax cuts for employers. Really what we need is to give money to the folks who are hurting most and mm -hmm. therefore will benefit most from getting the funds. Yeah, no, I, I, I think I think that's a very, very difficult dance as we saw with the distribution of the PPP funds, right? And it, and it very quickly becomes a political a political issue. For people who didn't apply for the PPP, there's a, a great story and I believe it was yesterday's New York Times about how, um, or, no, it was yesterday's Philadelphia Inquirer about, you know, if you need this money, there's still some money there and you should go ahead and do that while the getting is still good. Would you agree? Absolutely. Uh, you know, the first option that people should turn to if they can in this very difficult time is government help. So if you're unemployed, be patient and pursue those unemployment benefits. If you're a small business in trouble, it's not just the PPP loans, but there's another emergency loan program at the Small Business Administration. Some state and local governments have loan facilities and grant facilities. Even commercial loans right now are quite cheap because interest rates are low. Um, go out and get the money. If you think that your business can survive, and certainly your family has to survive, You know, now is the time to get yourself some help. Um, the, uh, you know, the government has provided a lot of resources and the PPP program is not closed down yet. So I really want folks to go out and, and talk to their local bankers about what the options are. Yeah. And especially for those um, independent contractors, self-employed people who may continue to think that they are not eligible. You are eligible. You work for yourself. You still have to pay yourself. You are eligible. So, um, so I would totally totally agree about that. Let, let's talk a little bit about the playbook for people who are struggling right now. Um, I mean, you're, you're right. A lot of people are still being propped up by that additional $600 in unemployment benefits, the additional thir 13 weeks added to the unemployment clock. But those dollars will start to wind down. People are going to need money where do we go to access the money to live on when we're when we're between the rock and the hard place and we don't have as enough in the way of emergency savings what do we turn to well so i want to i want to put an exclamation point on the point you just made about emergency savings you and i have talked before about 
you know, the Federal Reserve did a study that found that about 40% of Americans don't have or couldn't easily access $400 for an emergency situation. Yeah. Um, that's pretty disturbing because this is an emergency situation where $400 isn't going to get you very far. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons. Let me start with the answer that I gave before. It's very important for government to intervene. There is some talk about additional stimulus checks going out to people. Remember, there were checks going out of $1,200 per person under a certain uh, uh, income level. Uh, unemployment benefits are also another way that people can support themselves, even if that supplement is reduced. I, there's not a lot of people advocating for eliminating it, but but there, I think it may end up being reduced. Still, it will be better than nothing. But then the question is, if that's not enough, what do you do? So. Congress uh, made it possible for folks to withdraw money from their retirement plans up to $100,000 without paying the usual tax penalty. Usually, if you withdraw the money before you're 59 and a half years old, um, unless there's a hardship situation, right. you have to pay not just the income taxes on that money that you would have otherwise had to pay, but you also have to pay a 10% penalty. So Congress has waived that 10% penalty as long as you pay the money back uh, over the course of three years. Uh, but I, uh, and also let me say, they increase the amount that retirement plans can allow uh, their participants to borrow against their retirement savings up to $100,000. Not every plan is gonna do that, but plans are, gonna allow to, uh, are going to be allowed to do that. I really, really don't want people to take money out of their retirement plans unless there really is no alternative. Even though the tax penalty is waived uh, and you have three years to pay it back, I just I worry very much as just as a behavioral matter that folks will not pay themselves back. So if you take a loan out of a bank, which is very cheap now, I want to keep saying that because interest rates are so low. They are so low. Are, yeah, very low. So you can it's cheap to take, take, borrow money from a bank. Don't borrow it on your credit cards, for goodness sakes, but you can borrow money, make a personal loan, get a home equity loan or something like that. The bank is gonna make sure you repay that money, right? They'll keep reminding you, they'll give you a coupon book. If you borrow from yourself, really, if you take money out of your retirement plan, what you're doing is you're borrowing from your future self, right? You're borrowing from Seth Harris at age 80, at 75, at 70 when you're retired. I worry that people won't pay themselves back. You know, it's the, it'll be the last thing on their minds. They won't have a coupon book. They won't get a reminder uh, letter in the mail. They won't get a call from somebody at the bank to remind them to repay. So I really worry about that. Even if it is a little cheaper to take the money out of your retirement plan and then put it back, don't do it. Don't do it unless you have a plan to pay the money back. You know, say to yourself, what, how much do I have to pay per month mm -hmm. to get myself back to where I was with my retirement savings? If you don't have a plan like that, try not to take the money out. Look at other alternatives. Government, maybe a, a cheap commercial loan if you can get it. Not credit cards, not payday lending, for goodness sakes. No, but a personal loan, maybe. A personal loan, absolutely, if you can. Or if, you know, if you have a home and you have some equity in the home, an inexpensive home equity loan. Mortgage interest rates are very low right now. That's another way to go. I want you to, I, I worry about you 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, not just today. And I know it's it's a hard choice. You know, do I worry about my bills today? Do I worry about my retirement income tomorrow? I want you to think about both in making those decisions. Well, it's a very it's a very important behavioral point because um, I, I've read enough about this to know that you know we don't take our future selves at all seriously enough. You know, we are so present minded just because we're human that it is really difficult. Um, I don't want I, I do want to go back. I, let me say hello to the people who've been weighing in. Hi to everybody. Thank you to Dora. I'm glad you enjoyed the book. I appreciate that, mm -hmm. um, Kelly is unclear on whether the withdrawal from a 401k is a loan or not. It, it actually, Kelly, can be either one. So when you borrow from a 401k, you typically have five years to pay the money back to your own 401k account. That's how those loans are currently structured. And as Seth said, the um, CARES Act doubled the amount of money you can borrow. When you withdraw, 
you have to pay taxes on that money. Both both are having the penalties wait right now, but when you withdraw, you have to pay taxes on this money. What the CARES Act did was say, if you repay the money within three years, then you don't have to pay the taxes. And Seth, I'm wondering if you think in this environment that makes a withdrawal, if you think you're gonna be paying it back better than borrowing, or are they both just bad? Yeah, I. so it's sort of a, you know, there, there, are, there are times in life when there are no good answers, there are bad answers and worse answers. And that's sort of where we are, unfortunately. And a lot of families are in that situation right now. And I don't want to make light of it. It's a very serious situation. Um, as you said, Gene, if you take the money out as a withdrawal, you pay the income taxes on whatever the gains were and whatever the amount you originally put in would be, right? Just like you would if you did a withdrawal in any other circumstance from a retirement plan. So you have to sort of do the math on whether that amount is greater than the interest you would be paying on a loan against your retirement savings and which one is cheaper to you. My, my point is compare both of those to a commercial loan. Yeah. What's gonna be cheapest, right? So if you can get a home equity loan at 2% or 3% or 4%, that might be better than a loan that you would get from your retirement plan that's four or five or six percent and it would be better than the tax hit you would take on taking the money out of your account uh, withdrawing the money from your retirement plan now even though you have three years to pay it back and you don't have tax liability if you pay it back within three years still that tax hit you should assume that you're going to suffer it so it's going to require a little bit of planning a little bit of thinking and that's a good thing do, what folks should not do, and Jane, let me just say, you're the leading advocate of this position. Don't, and you said this to me and it really stuck with me and it's, I think it's so powerful. Don't create a long-term problem with a short-term solution, right? And I think that's absolutely right. Don't do something quickly when you're going to pay the price for it for years and years and years. Really yeah. think through how you're going to get the money that you need. That's why you shouldn't just whip out your credit card. That's almost certainly the second worst solution after payday loans. Yeah, yeah. Um, Laura is wondering, and, and then I do want to come back to to the investments and, and the markets, because I, I, I want to address the fact that there is clearly some sort of wishful thinking going on here. Um, <laughs> Laura is wondering what amount would you recommend having in that emergency savings account? You know, it's all a function of uh, what your personal expenses are. Um, you know, the, in the, the guidance I once saw was that everybody should have liquid savings of three months of their salary so that if you lose your job, you can live for three months without earning any. Most people I don't have, I mean, saving enough to have three months worth of salary, that's a large amount of money from, you know, compared to revenue for most people. So I want you to have enough money so that if your car breaks down, you can get it fixed. So it, that if there's some kind of damage done to your house or if your, your, your boiler goes out or your air conditioning goes out, you can fix it without having to put it on a credit card. So you have to figure out for yourself what that amount is going to be. And also you want to be able to do that without having to whip out the credit card, right? You don't want your credit card to be your emergency savings plan. So for some people that's $400, for some people that's $1,000. It's really what you can afford, but you should be engaged in emergency savings alongside your retirement savings because you don't want to have to tap your retirement savings for those emergencies. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think I think these three to six month guidelines are pipe dreams in a lot of cases. And if you can have a couple thousand dollars, you you have a lot of insurance against the things that tend to happen in this world. April's wondering for those people who do have solid emergency funds, is it still a good idea to consider a personal loan? I would say probably not. Um, but you may want to consider if you're if you're still employed, you may want to consider a home equity line of credit as just a back pocket emergency cushion. So you you sign you apply for it, you don't pull the money out because you don't need the money right now. But at least you've structured this line of credit in case you need it down the road. You agree? 
Oh, I agree with that completely. Don't borrow money you don't need. Don't pay interest on money that you don't have to have. But opening up uh, what they call a HELOC, right, the home equity line of credit, gives you a little bit more flexibility. And the advantage of home equity loans is that the interest is tax deductible, right? Depending upon what's going on in your jurisdiction and you know there are caps on how much you can deduct, uh, you know, and you have there's the uh, there's standard deduction complexity, but the HELOC is a better way to go if you can go that way. But again, if you don't need it, if you've got emergency savings, if you've got a revenue source, you've got a job, you've got a business, you don't need it, so don't borrow it. Yeah, agreed. All right, let's talk about the markets. Um, the markets, it, it, you look at the stock markets and you would think that there's nothing wrong in the world. What? Why, why is that? And how do we look at our retirement um, and not get kind of sick to our stomach? Yeah, uh, so uh, if ever we needed evidence that there is no relationship or almost no relationship between the markets and our economy, this period is that. Um, the markets are doing pretty well. They're not back to where they were, but they're doing pretty well. And the reason for that is that the Federal Reserve and in its infinite wisdom has absolutely flooded both equity and, and debt markets with trillions of dollars in resources. And what they've also done is by buying up large amounts of debt, they have made the yield on debt so unattractive to investors that investors just don't want to go into the debt markets. And instead, they're putting their money into the stock market because that money has to go somewhere. They can't put it in their mat, whatever uh, uh, an invest a hedge funds mattress looks like. They can't throw it in their mattress. So they are putting it into equities and that's driving up the value of equities well beyond the traditional uh, what's called price to earnings ratio. It's it's an overvalued market right now, given the amount of money that these companies are making. Um, so that is a really bad indicator, or it's not a good indicator, or a clear indicator, or an accurate indicator of where the economy is going. It's good for people like me who do very well and have plenty of money and have our money invested in the stock market. We're doing fine. But for the large majority of Americans who have either very little or nothing in the markets, it doesn't help them in the least. Um, and so what it's doing is it's exacerbating wealth inequality. Um, and for those who have retirement savings in the markets, it's buoyed those retirement savings after a period of unfathomable vol volatility in these markets. Gene, you and I have talked about this as well. Uh, the Great Recession there's there's uh, th this instrument called the VIX. The, it's the volatility index. You can actually invest in volatility if that's the way you go. Um, and it measures how much prices are changing and how radically they're changing in a short period of time on the markets. And it usually floats, it's on a scale of 100, it floats between 15 and 25. During the Great Recession, the big crash, it got as high as 60, 65. During this period, it went as high as 85. Well, that's an unbelievable level of volatility. So people who have retirement save re their retirement savings invested in the markets feel like they're on a roller coaster with no yes. protection bar and no straps, right? There's no safety protections. They felt like they were they were going to crash. Fortunately, the markets have come back largely, not entirely. The Nasdaq is doing better than the New York Stock Exchange. But um, again, it's it's something of a, a a false story, and it shouldn't get, suggest that everything's going just fine in the economy because Main Street is feeling a lot of pain, lots of small businesses going out of business, lots of families on the verge of personal bankruptcy. If they weren't getting those unemployment checks, they might be in personal bankruptcy. Um, lots of businesses right-sizing, meaning narrowing the amount of work that they do, shedding a lot of employees, lots of people on the unemployment lines and losing their jobs every week. Um, that's got nothing to do with what's going on on Wall Street, where things are going fairly well. And let me just say, to me, that's a very sad outcome as a public policy matter. Yeah. Wealthy people, wealthy people, rich people who have their money in capital, in capital investments, doing just fine. Working people who depend on their labor really struggling, and that's not where we should be in our country. 
totally, totally agree with that. Pedro is asking if, if, if I'm reading this question correctly, and, and um, nice to see you, Pedro. Pedro is asking if that, if this is a short term, um, he's not using the word bubble, but I will. That will, that's going to come back to bite us. And, and I think. I'd love to know your answer. You know, I I got very very nervous in this market, more nervous than I got in um, 2008, and I think that has absolutely everything to do with my age. Right? I'm I'm 55. I'm I you know I can't see retirement tomorrow, but it's it's somewhere over a couple of hills. I, I don't want to lose this money that I have. Um, I have spent years and years accumulating, and yet. You know, as during this time where we're supposed to be over over the years reducing the amount of risk in our portfolio, putting money in bonds makes absolutely no sense. Right. Um, so, so what do we? You know, what? How do we do deal with this right now? And can you just talk for a couple minutes, maybe about the role that an annuity might play and how it can level set? Yeah. Yeah, I, so I think this is a very important point. So you're right that investing in the bond market right now is nutty. Um, there's just nothing to be had there. The reasons that people want to invest in bonds is that as a general matter, they're fairly safe investments. You know, government bonds being the safest, corporate bonds being somewhat less safe, but you know, you're protected in bankruptcy uh, uh, if you own debt. So you're a little bit better off than the than the people who own shares in the company. Um, so the reason that people want it is because it's a safe investment, but because it's so safe, it tends to be a very low return investment. Annuities can play essentially the same role in your portfolio if you buy what's called a guarantee. And what the guarantee does is it's, it's kind of an insurance against the value of the investments in your annuity going down, right? So, or even if the value does go down, the amount of retirement income the annuity is going to provide to you does not go down. So it operates kind of like a low risk investment, but some annuities allow you to invest fairly aggressively in equities, in indexes, in other things so that you can grow your retirement savings. And this is one of the big challenges that a lot of Americans have is they have some retirement savings, but it's nowhere near enough yeah. to support them in supplementing Social Security, it won't support them in the lifestyle they want to lead in their retirement. So if you can buy a guarantee, get insurance against the value of your um, uh, investments going down, you can take some more risk. You can take added risk. So it's and not free, it, right? I mean, you're paying right, for no, insurance. Yeah, there are fees, right? They, they, it, just like any, just like you and I pay insurance on our homeowners. A home, we pay fees for our homeowner's insurance, our car insurance, our health insurance. It's the same thing. It's sort of stock market insurance, right? Or investment insurance that you're buying. But you can invest more aggressively. And hopefully the growth that you will get from that more aggressive investing will more than pay you back the cost of the insurance. That's the hope. You have to talk to a financial professional, somebody who's an expert in annuities and ask them about it and ask in great detail. And you want to know the details about the fees and how long the fees last. And is it a commission or you want to talk about all of that. But you know, when the bond market makes no sense, and even sometimes when the bond market might make sense, an annuity is a really interesting alternative to look at it. And let me just say to the first part of your question, I don't think this is a bubble. You know, a bubble is when, as former Fed chair Alan Greenspan says, when there's irrational exuberance, people are too enthusiastic about a particular category of stocks, like we were with the so-called dot-com bubble right. back in the early 2000s. Everybody, anything with a dot-com, pets.com, everybody got really excited and put a lot of money in it. And then a lot of these companies just failed. Um, but now what's happening is the Federal Reserve is responsible for the valuations on Wall Street. And the Federal Reserve doesn't want the markets to crash. So it's not gonna pull the rug out dramatically. It, it's gonna ease off slowly over time and no time soon. So I don't think we're at risk of a bubble burst, but I think folks, and, and I agree with you, Gene, folks need to be, and I'm a little older than you are, so I'm, a, I'm maybe a little closer to the point when this is gonna matter, but 
I want people to be really cautious about where they put their money. Don't get caught up in all this excitement about particular stocks or particular portfolios or particular indexes. Right? Follow a cautious, responsible plan where you have a mixed, diversified investment uh, approach, and you're, you know, making sure that you have enough, and you're not buying a lottery ticket because you don't want to depend on that lottery ticket to be able to support you in your retirement. My favorite investing mantra has always been boring is better. That's um, usually true. Let me just say <laughs> life, boring is better. Absolutely. Um, except on this, except on this broadcast, of course, this is very exciting stuff for people. I know. I, I, only because you're our guest today. <laughs> so on, on that note, I am going to say a big thank you. Thank you to everybody who was watching. Um, we will be back next week. For more information, head to protectedincome.org. And everybody should be following Seth on social media, on Twitter, and, and all of the other channels. And are there other places you'd like us to, to go to find more about you? Twitter and LinkedIn are the best places to uh, find out information about me and to, to monitor some of my TV appearances and other ideas that just pop into my head and I throw them out on social media. Absolutely. All right, Seth, we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Gene.